about five minutes to get to Parkman Hospital, and I didn't learn that he was dead until I got back here to the station. The reaction, I think, among the crowds who are now standing around streets in downtown Dallas, tuned into their radios, they're just standing around. Nobody's really saying much except it's, it's just unbelievable. And why? And I guess we'll never know the answer to that. The free world mourns the death by sniper's bullet this afternoon of the President of the United States, John Kennedy. He was cut down in the streets of Dallas, Texas, by an unknown rifleman firing from a warehouse window. The president died 30 minutes later in hospital, age 46. When shot, he fell into the arms of his wife riding beside him. Another shot wounded the governor of Texas, Governor Connolly. A gasp of horror was heard in the House of Commons in Ottawa when Prime Minister Pearson announced the tragic news. He said that the world can ill afford to lose such a man at this time a man of courage and determination to advance the causes of freedom of his own country and the world. Mr. Pearson added, this is a tragedy too for the president's family and the American people, but one in which all Canadians will share. Mr. Diefenbaker, leader of the opposition, said there are no divisions between us at this moment. Free men everywhere are mourning. President Kennedy was the tribune of freedom and the embodiment of it. Moscow announced the assassination five minutes ago. The Soviet news agency task claimed that Mr. Kennedy had been killed by what it called extreme right-wing elements. We now rejoin the NBC radio network. The, church, the famous Trinity Church at the head of Wall Street. Uh, this was a huge blow to everyone. The stock exchange closed at 209, closed by the Board of Governors when the floor was in a chaotic condition. Perhaps you can hear the bells behind me now. Trinity Church's bells are ringing again. Uh, our reaction is not from presidents or heads of church, but from his fellow citizens, among them the first young Negro. Kennedy is like losing his father. He's been like a father to everyone in this nation. Person, everyone in this nation, you know, miss him very much. I, I don't know why they did it. Kennedy didn't do nothing to nobody in the country. He tried to help everybody in the home. Everybody try to help, help as much as he can. I don't know why and how they could do anything like this to him. Sir, what will it do to business? Well, I don't think it will affect business at all, sir. I believe that we had a great president who was doing a lot for business, and I believe that he set a trend that uh, Americans will I recognize and follow, and I think if anything, it will help us become more dedicated to helping our businesses and helping our nation. Yeah. Those are the causes that he believed in. Well, I believe the causes that President Kennedy believes in are the causes that all Americans believe in. Whether or not someone said they were a Kennedy man prior to this, I'm sure that we all join today in grieving for him and in recognizing that he had uh, at his heart the hearts of all Americans and that he was striving to accomplish for this nation what we all would want to all over the city, wherever there's a radio turned on, as of course we have had to keep our radio turned on to keep abreast of what is happening. Uh, with me now are people gathered around, any, any such uh, means of information. Uh, course, Joe? Yes. I'm Morgan Beatty, NBC News Central in New York. I think maybe it would be of interest to you to know and to the people whose voices have just come to us from Trinity Church that the Voice of America is carrying this broadcast around the world. So these people have made perhaps their first global broadcast and they probably are totally unaware of it. Well, I'm sure we're all grateful for that. Uh, not particularly, however, for the occasion. The, um, the feeling is mostly shock. People find it hard to put into words how they feel. They, they, they wander around looking stunned. They, they pick up a newspaper from the stand and look at it almost unseeingly and then uh, ask each other if it's true. And then people ask each other, what's going to happen next? And uh, like all of us, except for the fact that we have faith in our country, nobody has any of those answers. Morgan. Well, Joe, this is an appropriate moment with the bells of Trinity Church ringing at your back. The transfer across the Atlantic and the Mediterranean to the headquarters of yes. another church, of another faith. We switch now to Irving Art.
ABC News in Rome. Shock and grief are the reactions in Italy where President Kennedy was enormously popular. Italian President Spanier immediately sent an aide to the American Embassy to express his sympathy. President Spanier called President Kennedy's death a great loss to humanity. First Colonel is preparing a radiogram which is expected to be ready within an hour. Italian radio and television made the announcement of the president's death and then went off the air except for solemn music. Cardinal Spellman and other American bishops in Rome for the ecumenical council expressed shock. Cardinal Spellman said that he is saying rosary for President Kennedy now. Irving R. Levine, NBC News, Rome. Irving, would you stay on a few moments? Perhaps we will have more from you, but we do have urgent reports from Fort Worth, Texas. Soon after President Kennedy was assassinated today in Dallas, a white man in his mid-twenties was arrested in the Riverside section of Fort Worth. Uh, apparently, he is connected uh, by the police, at least, with the shooting of a Dallas policeman. Uh, this is quite a mystery. A Secret Service man and a policeman, a Dallas policeman and a Washington S Secret Service man, were shot some distance from where the assassination occurred of President Kennedy. We have not yet... Uh, had word as to exactly what connection the shooting possibly in Fort Worth had. But this man who was arrested in Fort Worth was a man with black curly hair. He wore a red shirt. He said he was not connected with the assassination of the president. He told that to reporters. Uh, but he was urged on by the police. His hands were handcuffed and he was taken to the Fort Worth City Jail. And now, uh, Irving, a few more uh, facts in detail from, da from Dallas, if we may, at this point. President Kennedy's body was removed from Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas at 2.05 p.m. Central Standard Time. It was taken away in a long, green-colored ambulance with off-white curtains tightly drawn. Mrs. Kennedy rode in the passenger seat in the ambulance. That's the type of vehicle with, uh, vehicle with two seats for passengers. She and the president's body were escorted from the emergency entrance of Parkland by two motorcycle officers. Mrs. Kennedy walked out of the back door of the emergency entrance as the body was taken out. She walked slowly. She looked around her in a dazed manner, and she appeared to be in a state of shock. Another announcement, White House Secretary Malcolm Kildup said the president's body would be flown to Washington this afternoon, almost immediately. The Dallas, Dallas Sheriff's Department says a rifle has been found in a staircase on the fifth floor of that warehouse building near the scene of the assassination. And now we have confirmation of exactly the kind of weapon. It was a 7.65 Mauser rifle. German-made army rifle had a telescopic sight with one shell left in the chamber. Three spent shells were found nearby. As you noted before, we've had reports that there were either two or three shots. The police credit three shots were being fired. And incidentally, the third shot apparently struck Governor Connolly of Texas because he was wounded in two places. One place is, of course, of no importance, but the wound in the back under the shoulder blade is the one for which Governor Connolly of Texas is now being operated on. His condition is still serious, although his physicians feel that the vital points, his pulse, his reaction generally are mean uh, that he may well pull through. Irving? Yes, Morgan. Are you still on? Yes, Morgan. We thought perhaps maybe you had more reaction from Rome to give us, and we didn't know. Yes, Morgan. I've just received a phone call from our cameraman who is on the Sea of Monaco, which, as you know, is the main tourist section of Rome. And he reports that there are American tourists there who are actually standing on the sidewalk looking at the newspapers and crying. We also have... Uh, this word, uh, the Italian state radio, has likened President Kennedy's death to that of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, we expect to have the text of uh, Pope Paul's message of sympathy in a very few minutes. Well, that about clears us up there. Cardinal Spellman has, is now saying his rosaries for the President of the United States. Is the Ecumenical Council still in session at this moment? No more than it's uh, late at night here now, about 9.30 p.m. The council is only in the morning, uh, but several of the cardinals, the American cardinals who live at the North American College, where young American priests are trained, uh, gathered the young seminarians together and joined in prayer.
Well, thank you, Irving, and please stand by. We're sorry to keep you up so late in Rome, but you, of course, understand the circumstances, and we'll back, be back with you later. And now we have another bulletin from Dallas. White House authorities report that the body of President Kennedy will arrive in Washington at 5.30 p.m. That would apparently mean at 5.30 p.m. standard time, it's now... Uh, Something after 2.30 p.m. Dallas time, I assume we can guess that the body will be flown back to Washington immediately uh, so that the episode in Dallas will be completed within a very brief period of time. Uh, we have no further police reports or Secret Service reports showing exactly what connection there is in the fatal shooting of a Dallas policeman and a Secret Service man Apparently in the area of Fort Worth, Texas, one white man has been arrested in connection with that. Apparently the assassin of the President of the United States was a white man in his 30s. At least such a man was seen near the place where the President was shot in Dallas about 12.30 p.m. this afternoon. Incidentally, if we may revive the scene for the moment, to give you the exact placing in the presidential car of those who were closest to the chief executive when he was fatally shot. President Kennedy and Governor Connolly of Texas and their wives had been riding together in the president's familiar dark blue bubble top convertible. They were leaving downtown Dallas at the time the assassination occurred near a triple culvert and the shot that was fired at the president was fired from apparently the fifth floor of a warehouse by a 7.65 Mauser, that is a German army rifle. Apparently three shots were fired. One stuck, struck the president of the United States in the right temple and went cleanly through his head. The White House physician has said it was a simple case of a bullet going clear through a man's head. Incidentally, uh, in the, the transparent plastic roof of the presidential car when the shooting occurred, uh, uh, that is, the plastic roof of the car had been removed from the motorcade so that the president was riding in an open car at the time. Secret service agents riding with the president and in a second convertible following closely behind immediately drew pistols and automatic weapons, but there was no possibility of their firing at anybody with any effect without causing some kind of an accident. We have a bulletin from New York now. The League of New York Theaters announces that all Broadway theaters will be closed tonight. Willard Keith, spokesman for the League, says all League members shows on the road also will be closed tonight in the beginning of the period of mourning for the death of the President of the United States. NBC News has learned that the military officers charged with arranging for state funerals are at the White House at this moment, discussing possible funeral plans. Mr. Kennedy is the first president to die in office under the new Defense Department setup. So protocol will have to be written as it is. That is, uh, the idea of the military handling a funeral of the president of the United States is an entirely new one, and they will have to set precedence at this time. Uh, for those of you who may not know about it, uh, one of the important facts of life in Washington is that the military is in charge of the District of Columbia in many ways. The Capitol building and so on is the only uh, building there that's excluded from their direct charge, and they are indirectly in charge of that. So that uh, it is entirely fitting, as was done a few years ago, that the Defense Department should handle affairs such as the one that we have regretfully and sadly before us, a funeral of another president of the United States. And this one, in the terrible, terrible tradition of Lincoln and McKinley. The Army will have charge as usual. There are cashions and cassons and ceremonial horses at Fort Myer, Virginia, of course, along with units of troops ready for use in such, in such capacity so that Fort Myer will take charge of the funeral arrangements for President John Kennedy of the United States. And now more reaction from the Capitol. We switch now to NBC's Robert McCormick at the Capitol for reaction in the House of Representatives. 
Actually, this is reaction from the Senate. One of the first members of Congress to get the bad news was one of President Kennedy's oldest friends, Senate Democratic Leader Mansfield. He turned pale when he heard the news, and then he and Dirksen together left the chamber to call the White House. Here is what Senator Mansfield had to tell us later. The passing of John Fitzgerald Kennedy is not only a tragedy for the nation which he so ably represented, but is, I think, also a mark upon the respectability and the responsibility of some of our citizens. This good, this decent, this kindly man, this harassed man who had so much on his shoulders, and received from some people so little in the way of support in return. This man has now gone to his reward. And I will miss him as a personal friend. The nation will miss him as a great president. And the world will miss him as a great leader. One of the fondest memories I can recall is the cooperation and the support which the distinguished senator from Illinois, Mr. Dirks, the minority leader of the Senate, gave to the president of the United States, a Democrat, time and time again, when the interests of the nation were at stake. And I know how grateful he was to you for the many contributions you made, and I'm just as grateful, and the nation is too. Words are, words are useless to express one's true feelings at a moment like this. My a person's perplexity is just too great in a tragic moment like this. That last voice was Senate Republican leader Dirksen. Capitol officials have told us that they are making tentative arrangements for the body of the late President Kennedy to lie in state in the rotunda of the Capitol for the stipulated period of mourning so he can be viewed by the people of the country. The city of Washington, by the way, is packed with people in the streets, and uh, they are concerned about rumors that something has happened to Vice President Johnson. The word we get here from Senate Democratic Leader Mansfield and others is that uh, the Vice President Johnson, perhaps now President, we've not had word whether he's sworn in, is quite all right. Ironically, the chair of the Senate was occupied by the President's brother when the President was shot. Senator Edward Kennedy had been presiding over a rather dull session. A Richard Riedel, who manned one of the doors to the Senate lobby, brought the news into the Senate of what had happened and had the, had the terrible job of telling Senator Kennedy that his brother had been shot. And here is the Mr. Riedel's story. Richard Riedel, who I've already given my name, uh, firstly, as on which means the contact between the Washington correspondents, members of the press gallery, radio, television correspondents, White House news photographers, and the periodical press, with the senators on the floor arranging appointments, asking them questions. In the 45 years I have been on the staff of the Senate, since September 27, 1918, when I was a nine-year-old boy and a page for four years, this is one of the most, uh, this is one of the hardest blows and one of the most moving, tragic experiences that I have ever known to sweep over the summit. I, I may have first time later mention when President Roosevelt died and President Truman Vice President then was presiding and the word of his evidence. Well, uh, the routine, the tickers in the lobby, AP and UP tickers, are read by senators and staff members for routine information. Uh, Phyllis Rock of the staff of Senator Morse of Oregon was in the lobby by herself reading the ticker. Uh, she turned to one of my assistants, Tom Pelican, who is with Senator Long of Missouri, in his office part of the time, and said the president has been shot. Tom rushed out to tell me. I immediately went 
into the Senate chamber to the over to in front of the desk of of uh, Majority Leader Senator Mike Mansfield, raised my voice so that he and the senators the surrounding desk could hear and said, Senators, the president has been shot. It, of course, was like a shockwave, a jolt. I crossed the aisle to the Republican side where Senator Dirksen was seated and in the same manner told Senator Dirksen and the Republican senators who were at adjacent desks uh, with, of course, the same sharp reaction and stunned uh, expression on their faces. I then happened to recall that a few moments before, the president's brother, uh, Senator uh, Edward Kennedy of Massachusetts, was presiding over the Senate. I turned and he was still occupying the chair. I knew that someone would have to inform me. I thought I might as well. It was a very difficult, very difficult job because of the family relationship as well as the friendship of the son of his cousins. I rushed up to the chair and said, Senator, Senator Kennedy, your brother, the president, has been shot. He gave a, a jerk to his body. His body tensed, but he was absolutely calm. And as I recall, Senator Kennedy, then presiding over the Senate, when he heard this awful news, said no. And that was all. In an orderly manner, he gathered up the papers on his desk that he, his routine office, a work that he brings when he presides over the Senate so that he can conserve the time, the long hours presiding over the Senate by working at his office work. I walked off the rostrum with him with my arm around Senator Kennedy, patting his shoulders, and said, Senator, if there's anything any of us can do, let us know. My own suggestion would be that you contact the Air Force and have them rush you out to Texas to your brother's side in a jet, in a military jet. Well, of course, that turns out now to be unnecessary because the president's body is being flown back to Washington and is expected to arrive there at 5.30 p.m. And in that connection, uh, we can report that President Johnson is expected to take the oath of office as President of the United States aboard an airliner before, before flying immediately back to the nation's capital. The entire Kennedy party, of course, is flying back immediately to Washington. That was from NBC Radio News. A gasp of horror was heard in the House of Commons in Ottawa when the Prime Minister announced the tragic news. He said that the world can ill afford to lose such a man at this time, a man of courage and a determination to advance the causes of freedom of his own country and the world. We now join the Mutual Broadcasting System for a special news broadcast. Johnson had a heart attack. And a 
back in, there was that numbness. And then there was the denial that Johnson had suffered this heart attack. A moving report from Joe Barry in Paris by direct wire. We just received the report. Now let's switch again to George Hamilton Combs at the United Nations. This is George Hamilton Combs at the United Nations. The Delegates Lounge, which is usually a crowded, bustling place with three or four deep lined up at the bar, is almost deserted today except for scattered knots of delegates who are standing discussing the death of President Kennedy with a grave and sorrowful mien. A moment ago, one of the leaders of the African bloc, Ambassador Nathan Barnes of Liberia, told me that he regarded this as one of the great tragedies of human history, saying that President Kennedy had worked tirelessly for the emancipation of the Negro at home and for the end of colonialism abroad and that he hoped that his successor would carry on this work. There were similar expressions of opinion, which I shall bring you later, from other African, as well as European and Asian nations. But uh, the mood still is primarily one of incredulity, of disbelief, and of deep shock. Wherever there are expressions of overt emotion, they are angry and uh, outraged, with one delegate calling this one of the most dastardly acts of history. A pall has descended over the United Nations. When that pall will be lifted, no man today can foresee. This is George Hamilton Combs, returning you now to our studios. We switch now to Washington. And from Mutual News, we're going to switch directly to Bill Slayton, of Mutual's affiliate WJQS in Jackson, Mississippi, with a statement on the president's death from Mississippi Governor Ross Barnett. Go ahead, Bill Slayton. Mississippi Governor Ross Barnett has sent a telegram to the president's widow expressing sympathy and shock of the president's death. The telegram said, quote, I am profoundly shocked and deeply distressed at the cowardly act which resulted in the tragic death of President Kennedy. I extend my deepest and most sincere sympathy to you and your children. May God comfort you and sustain you in your great loss. Unquote. The governor ordered the state and national flags lowered to half-mast at the state capitol. An aide said Governor-elect Paul Johnson would have a statement later on the president's death. Bill Slayton, Jackson, Mississippi. There you have the story from uh, Bill Slayton of WJQS Mutual in Jackson, Mississippi. We're going to go to Ken French, who's been standing by at Mutual's point at the White House. Uh, what's the story there, Ken? The White House is a place of great sorrow. The office of Pierre Salinger is trying to cope with its most difficult problem, but they too are groping, trying to assimilate the fact that the president is dead. There has been confusion concerning arrivals and departures. At one point, Charles Horsky, the president's advisor on national affairs, was manning the news desk. I asked him whether there was any such thing as a schedule. He said, no, absolutely nothing at the moment. This in the face of reports from outside that the president's body was aboard a plane and was due in Washington later today. Some sources say approximately 5.40. The White House says only sometime today. It's a quiet White House, a White House of a frequent, unashamed tear. Ken French, Mutual News, the White House. It has now been confirmed, by the way, Charles Batchelder who is at Andrews Air Force Base, Charles Batchelder of Mutual News, uh, reports that the presidential plane bearing the president's body will arrive at Andrews Air Force Base around 5.30 or 5.45 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's about uh, an hour and a half or two hours from now. For overseas reaction, let's switch live now to Mutual Surge Fliegers, Paris. This is Serge Flieger standing in the Boulevard des Capucines in Paris, and I can only report a scene of utter desolation as Frenchmen here and Europeans generally hear the terrible, shocking news of the death of American President John Kennedy. I stand here and I see people who have turned on their car radio and other people who have a transistor set 
They are listening to the last news. Uh, they are hearing the reports, the flashes from Washington and from the United States. They are ashen faced. They're white. They're really white in the face. And they're turning to each other and they say, what is going to happen? Kennedy is no more. This man who led the Western world towards, towards achievement, towards resistance to the communist menace is dead. They are profoundly upset, these Frenchmen who here on the boulevards of Paris they are about to go home, who've left the movies, who've left the music halls, and who've stopped to hear the news, the distressing news of the... Now to Washington. It's official now, Lyndon B. Johnson has been sworn in as the President of the United States. The oath administered by United States District Judge Sarah T. Hughes. Mr. Johnson took the oath President of the United States, aboard the presidential plane at Love Field in Dallas, Texas, just a short while ago. Mr. Johnson, now the President of the United States, is preparing to fly to Washington to take over the reins of government. We've got more reaction now coming in from the United States Department of State. On the scene, Mutual's Bill Evenson. The State Department, like everywhere else, is in a state of shock. The news that President Kennedy is dead has filled everyone with a deep, stunned sorrow. Most offices are for practical purposes closed as employees mill about and discuss the tragic event. But the high echelon offices of the department are in close touch with the White House and with Texas. As the word was passed that the body of President Kennedy will be returned to Washington this afternoon, the events of the afternoon became a reality. And now there are few dry eyes. Even the newsroom that generally rings with sounds of busy reporters is somewhat quiet. This sad day is apparent in the red eyes of everyone here. This is William Evanson at the State Department. More sidelights on the story. A Dallas policeman was shot and killed as he chased a suspected assassin of President Kennedy through a movie theater in the Oak Cliff section in the city of Dallas. 38-year-old officer Tippett, J.D. Tippett, was shot to death as he and another Dallas policeman ran to the rear exit of a Texas theater. According to police headquarters, at Dallas, Tippett fired a shot. The second officer rushed the suspect, and the suspect shot back and said it was all over now. And so President Kennedy died as the result of an assassin's bullet, a Dallas policeman also dead as the result of a bullet. And Vice President Johnson has now been sworn in as the new President of the United States. The brief, simple ceremony before a United States District Judge at Love Field in Texas, moments before Vice President, or now President Lyndon Johnson, boarded the presidential jet to fly back to Washington. As for President Kennedy, we're informed by Mutual News and uh, from Bill Costello, who is there with uh, the presidential party in Dallas, that the president's body, Mr. Kennedy's body, is being flown back to Washington and should be arriving in the nation's capital at Andrews Air Force Base at approximately 5.30 to 5.45 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Reaction, Moscow, that radio in the Soviet capital played funeral music after announcing the death of President Kennedy. The Western diplomats around the world in the Soviet capital were aghast. They couldn't believe it, and it's still a very difficult thing to believe. But it's true. The President of the United States is dead. American Ambassador Foyt Kohler to the Soviet Union, when he was told that Mr. Kennedy had died as the result of a gunshot wound, said he couldn't believe it. He said, it's terrible, just terrible. Radio Moscow quoting reports that what they call extreme right-wing elements were responsible for the assassination. Dr. Malcolm Perry, the attending surgeon at Parkman Hospital in Dallas, Texas, the man who attended President Kennedy said that when he arrived at the emergency room, he noticed the president was in a critical condition with a wound of the neck and the head. Then when asked if possibly the wounds could have been made by two bullets, the doctor, the attending physician, said he didn't know. He said immediate presumptive measures were taken, and Dr. Clark was called in, he's chief of neurosurgery, 
The second doctor called in, along with several other members of the staff. We were told that one transfusion was administered to the president just before 2 o'clock, but his official time of death listed in Dallas, Texas, at 5 minutes past 2. Riding with him in the now famous bubble car was the governor of Texas, Governor John Connolly, also receiving a wound from apparently the same assassin's bullet. Governor Connolly, also taken to Park Lawn Hospital, he too undergoing surgery, but the report from the mutual news team on the scene claims that Governor Connolly is in fine shape, considering what he's gone through. We're told that the president, and this is quite unofficial at the moment, although it, uh, it seems to be repetitive enough so that it may be official, the president suffered a gunshot wound in the head. Governor Connolly received a gunshot wound or wounds in the chest, and he seems to be out of danger, at least that's the word from Park Lawn Hospital authorities in Dallas, Texas. And the reaction continues to come in. Former President Eisenhower called the assassination of President Kennedy a despicable act. The former president, in a statement issued from his suite in a hotel, and he's in New York City, said, I share the sense of shock and dismay that all Americans feel at the despicable act that resulted in the death of our nation's president. Mrs. Eisenhower and I join with all other citizens in expressing our personal grief and prayerful concern to Mrs. Kennedy and all other members of the family. We're going to go now to Mutual's Ed Semprini, who normally covers all White House activities for us up at Cape Cod and up at Hyannisport. He's ready to go on a line to Hyannisport, Massachusetts. Go ahead, Ed Semprini. Residents of the seaside vacation retreat of Hyannisport, where the famed Kennedy compound stretches along the shores of Nantucket Sound, express shock and disbelief today at the news of the assassination of President Kennedy. The compound where the president maintained his summer home has been sealed off. State police and local police have barred reporters and sightseers from the compound area. It was learned that the president's mother, Mrs. Rose Kennedy, had been playing golf at the Hyannisport course at approximately the time her son was shot. She was informed of the tragedy by her chauffeur. American League baseball player Jimmy Pearsall, who recently purchased a home around the corner from the Kennedy compound, said he was on the golf course when informed that the president was assassinated. It's a terrible tragedy. I still cannot believe it, said Pearsall, a friend of the president. A longtime friend of the Kennedy family, Assistant Postmaster William O'Neill of Hyannisport, said he was shocked beyond words. Residents of the small Hyannisport community strolled the tree-shaded streets in shocked silence. An elderly woman entered the post office one block away from the Kennedy summer home, weeping unashamedly. It's such a terrible, terrible thing, she cried. The president's father, former ambassador Joseph P. Kennedy, was reported taking his usual afternoon nap at the time of the assassination of his son in Dallas. At this moment, it could not be determined how the tragic news was relayed to the former ambassador, who is slowly recovering from a stroke. Hyannis Sport is a village in mourning this afternoon. Ed Semprini, Mutual News in Hyannis Sport. These reports from the Mutual Broadcasting System. We pause 30 seconds. This is the CBC Radio Network. Vice President Lyndon Johnson, who was only a few yards from Mr. Kennedy when the sniper fired, has now assumed the presidency. John Kennedy, 36th President of the United States, was driving with his wife through cheering crowds in Dallas when rifle shots rang out, apparently fired from the upper story of a warehouse overlooking the roof. The President crumpled and fell, bleeding into the arms of his wife. Another shot wounded Governor Connolly of Texas in the wrist. A cry of horror arose from the crowd, turning to anger against the unseen assassin. The president and the governor were rushed to hospital. Mr. Kennedy was dying from his wounds, and two priests arrived to give him the last rites of the Roman Catholic Church. A few seconds later, he died, just 30 minutes after he was shot. A sense of dread fell over the city as hundreds of police, with drawn guns, closed all exits and began an intensive search of the buildings lining the scene of the crime. It then became known that a few minutes before the assassination, a policeman and a secret serviceman had been murdered in another part of Dallas. The police in the city had been alerted for possible trouble by extreme right-wing elements, 
But the warm welcome given the president by the crowd had calmed such fears. Police say that the president was shot with a high-powered service rifle, probably equipped with a telescopic sight. Ottawa, like other capitals around the world, was shocked and saddened by the news of President Kennedy's death. A gasp came from the floor of the House of Commons as Prime Minister Pearson made the announcement. Said the Prime Minister, the world can ill afford at this time to lose a man of President Kennedy's courage. It is a tragedy for all of us. No people outside the United States would share more deeply than Canadians, their neighbors, the grief of the American people. The opposition leader said free men everywhere will bow their heads in sorrow. A tribune of freedom has gone, said Mr. Diefenbaker. Whatever our disagreements may have been during the years, he stood as the embodiment of freedom not only in his own country, but throughout the world. Mr. Diefenbaker said Mr. Kennedy will be remembered for his efforts to bring about equality for all men, regardless of race. The leader of the New Democratic Party said Mr. Kennedy was a good friend of Canada and that the people of this country had a high regard for him. The social credit leader said President Kennedy brought the new youth and ambition to his office, which he filled with determination and vision. After the tributes of the party leaders, the House of Commons adjourned until Monday out of respect. Across the Atlantic, partway across the Mediterranean, for a conversation with Irving R. Levine in Rome. Hello, Morgan. Hello, Irving. What time is it? Over Morgan, there. it's 10 minutes to 11 uh, in the night. Uh, what kind of reports do you have for us? Well, Morgan, uh, here, uh, a crowd of several hundred American tourists are gathered in front of the United States Embassy, uh, drawn there by mutual grief. Uh, they are simply standing, reading the English-language Rome American uh, newspaper, a special edition. They're talking among themselves, some crying, uh, watching cars from other embassies arriving with expressions of sympathy. I have a message here, a statement by Francis Cardinal Spellman of New York, with whom I spoke a short while ago. Uh, the Cardinal said, I was terribly shocked and grief-stricken at the dreadful news of the President's death. I have never seen a more universal demonstration of sorrow from people in my lifetime. Bishops from all over the world here in Rome for the Ecumenical Council have been calling me. Cardinal Spellman continued by saying, it's a loss not only to his wonderful family, but to our country and a loss to the world. He lived only a short time, but he accomplished tremendous things. He was a brave and courageous man. That is the reaction there. I notice uh, we have papal reaction here on uh, the uh, death of the president. Uh, uh, do you uh, have any further reports on that? Yes, uh, Morgan, we have someone at the Vatican right now who in a moment or two will be telephoning, telephoning us uh, the text of uh, the Pope's uh, statement, a message uh, to the American people, to the United States. Uh, several other items. Uh, Premier-designate Aldo Moro has suspended his negotiations for formation of a new Italian government uh, out of sorrow. Uh, various political leaders, including the communists, have expressed their grief at this. Uh, President Senyi will attend a special church rite uh, tomorrow uh, to uh, mourn the president's passing. An index of the passing of the president of the United States in this very shocking manner. There are other indices of this. Incidentally, the Harvard-Yale football game scheduled for tomorrow will not be played because of the president's death. That was announced by a spokesman for Harvard. There is no decision immediately whether the game will be played a week from then or not. It gives an indication of the extent of the mourning and the depth of the shock. The assassination of President John Kennedy in Dallas, Texas at 12.30 p.m. Central Time today. Incidentally, six members of the president's cabinet were out of the country flying to Japan. They had been in Hawaii. Uh, an hour and a half out of Honolulu on their way to Japan, the secretaries were advised of the assassination and immediately they ordered the plane turned back. They were expected to move into Honolulu for refueling and to speed back to Washington. In the party were Secretary of State Dean Rust, Secretary of Commerce Luther Hodges, 
Secretary of Labor, W. Willard Wirtz, Secretary of the Interior, Stuart Udall, and Secretary of Agriculture, Orville Freeman. And their wives were with them. Secretary of the Treasury, Douglas Dillon, was the sixth cabinet member. Others aboard were Walter Heller, the chairman of the President's Council on Economic Advisors, and Mrs. Heller, and White House Press Secretary, Pierre Salinger, and Robert Manning, Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs. The meeting in Tokyo would have brought together the cabinet secretaries of the two countries for a meeting on trade and economic affairs. It was scheduled to open Monday and to run for three days. It would have been a most auspicious meeting because... The liberal and pro-American government of Japan has just been confirmed in office by an election. For the historical record, perhaps it would be fitting at this time, although unpleasant, to relate to you the details concerning the death of the President of the United States. The story that will go into the history books. He was administered the last rites of the Roman Catholic Church shortly after he was carried into the Parkland Hospital in Dallas. Emergent treatment, emergency treatment was given to the dying president. It was described to newsmen by two physicians, Drs. Kemp Clark and Malcolm Perry. Dr. Perry said Kennedy suffered a neck wound, a bullet wound in the lower part of the neck. There was a second wound in Kennedy's head, but Perry was not certain whether it was inflicted by the same bullet. The physician said the president lost consciousness as soon as he was hit and never revived. We never had any hope of saving his life, said Dr. Perry, though eight or ten physicians attending him attended him in a frantic but futile effort to keep him alive. And now to our newsroom for a bulletin. Police today sees Lee H. Oswald, identified as chairman of a fair play for Cuba committee, as the prime suspect in the assassination of President Kennedy today in Dallas, Texas. Repeating this bulletin, police today sees Lee H. Oswald, identified as chairman of a fair play for Cuba committee, as the prime suspect in the assassination of President Kennedy. Police at Oswald, 24 years old, was accused in the slaying of a Dallas policeman shortly after the shooting of President Kennedy. Police Captain Pat Ganaway said the suspect was an employee in the building where a rifle was found. Ganaway said the suspect had visited Russia and was married to a Russian. This has not been immediately confirmed. Once again, the man arrested as the prime suspect in the assassination of the U.S. president today was the chairman of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee in Dallas, Texas. A complete roundup of the news from the United States today at 2 o'clock. We return you now to Washington. Kurowski, will you the come? body of the late president will be taken directly to Bethesda, Bethesda Naval Hospital, north of Washington, as soon as Air Force One, the presidential jet, lands at Andrews Air Force Base. Aboard Air Force One, in addition to the body of former President Kennedy, is the new president, Lyndon Johnson. Making funeral arrangements for the late president is Sergeant Shriver, the director of the Peace Corps, and the president's brother-in-law. As of this moment, the president of... the children of President Kennedy and Mrs. Kennedy, John Jr. and Caroline, have not been told of Mr. Kennedy's death. They are in the executive mansion with their nurse, Maud Shaw. Mrs. Kennedy is believed to be aboard Air Force One, the presidential aircraft now flying from Dallas to Andrews Air Force Base in nearby Maryland. When Air Force One does land at Andrews, members of the cabinet who are in Washington or under secretaries of other agencies will be at Andrews to welcome President Lyndon Johnson. Robert Gorelsky, NBC News at the White House. And from the other end, in Capitol of uh, Pennsylvania Avenue, on Capitol Hill, an official announcement by the Speaker of the House of Representatives, John W. McCormick, who becomes first in line of succession for the presidency of the United States under President Johnson. Mr. McCormick has just announced that President Kennedy's body will lie in state at the White House tomorrow. Apparently, it has been planned instead of going immediately to the rotunda of the Capitol with the body of the president. First, he will lie in state at the White House, as was done in the case of President Roosevelt. And then... The body will be taken to the rotunda of the Capitol where the national mourning will begin. We had been planning to go back to Bonn, Germany for 
another report on reaction at the point of contact between east and west. But now we find we can go even closer to the point of contact between the two ideologies in today's world. We take you now to John Chancellor, NBC News in Berlin. The people of West Berlin mourned the president as one of their own tonight. After the first shock, many people began weeping openly over the death of a man who visited here five months ago and said, Ich bin ein Berliner. I am a Berliner. The news of the president's death swept across Berlin. The telephone exchange reported that it was swamped with calls and some of the equipment wouldn't work. As the news spread, people walked out into the streets on a cold, rainy night, asking one another if it was really true. In the restaurants along the Kurfürstendamm, the main street in West Berlin, customers gathered around radio and television sets. Most people watched for a while and then left their meals unfinished and just went home. At least one of the legitimate theaters in West Berlin stopped its performance in the middle, announced the tragic news, and canceled the evening's performance. A dance festival was stopped in a similar way. And a show at the West Berlin Sports Palace was halted by the news. Mayor Willy Brandt of West Berlin asked the people of the city to put candles in their windows tomorrow night in memory of the American president who had so eloquently, and only a few months ago, pledged his affection and allegiance to this city. Mayor Brandt, who is expected to go to the United States for the funeral, said tonight that with the first citizen of the free world, Berlin has lost its best friend. Students from Berlin's free university tonight will stage a midnight memorial march through the center of West Berlin. They will march on some of the streets traveled by the president when he visited this encircled city in June. The student march will end at the Schöneberg Rathaus, the city hall, where Mr. Kennedy made his famous I am a Berliner speech. Tonight, on a cold and rainy night, other West Berliners mourn him. There have been reports in Berlin that the West Berlin police are on the alert for any demonstrations that might take place near the Berlin Wall. The police refuse to confirm this report. So far, there have been no demonstrations of any size uh, around the wall, and the weather being what it is, cold and rainy, there probably will be one, uh, there will be none, uh, at the wall tonight. However, uh, an hour and five minutes from now, the students of the Free University will march, and uh, a slight tension comes to Berlin whenever large groups of people gather in either sector of the city. There has been, as far as can be told from West Berlin, no direct reaction yet from East Berlin to the news of the president's death. However, that is an understandable reaction. They are very slow to react in the East, and uh, so far, we have nothing, and that is standard. Thank you, John Chancellor. We now have the sad duty to report that the possibility arises that the death of President Kennedy is connected with the Cold War, and fairly definitely. The police department of Dallas, Texas, reports that Lee H. Oswald who was arrested in a theater in the outskirts of that city soon after the assassination of President Kennedy, is the prime suspect in the assassination of the president. They identify Lee H. Oswald, this black-haired, curly black-haired man in his 20s, as a chairman of a Fair Play for Cuba committee. Now, in that connection... It is interesting to note what the Fair Play for Cuba Committee is in the United States or the various committees that were formed in universities primarily a couple of years ago. I happen to have reported the, the Fair Play for Cuba Committee formation. This committee was originally formed with $5,000 traced directly by the Federal Bureau of Investigation from the hands of the Foreign Minister of Cuba, Raul to an American, and it was intended to build a backfire against the government of the United States here. Now, this does not indict all fair play for Cuba committees, but the fact is 
that Fidel Castro was the father of the Fair Play for Cuba committee idea in the United States, and the proof is complete and absolute from beginning to end. So we repeat the bulletin just received from Dallas, Texas. Lee H. Oswald, a young man in his 20s, black curly hair, was arrested in the theater in Dallas as the prime suspect in the assassination of President Kennedy. He scuffled with the police. He wounded one of the police. And when he was finally subdued after a pistol was taken away from him, he said, well, it's all over now. So all of the evidence points to the fact that the police of Dallas are on the track of a very tragic connection involving the death of the President of the United States. There was a slight, a slight further detail on that point. Oswald worked in the building from which the shots were fired at the president. His supervisor said he was there at noon. That was a warehouse about eight stories high. The shot was fired from a fifth or a six-story window. That has not been definitely determined yet. And there were workmen in the building refurbishing it for some reason or another. There were no tenants at the time in the building. So Oswald was a worker in this building. And... He had been there at noon. It was seen there by his supervisor at that time. The man's name is Lee H. Oswald. He's been identified as a chairman of a Fair Play for Cuba Committee. And the Fair Play for Cuba Committee was formed with money, dollars, supplied directly by Fidel Castro through his foreign minister, who was then in the United Nations about two years ago or three years ago. And we now have what at least is an indirect connection with the situation. NW time is one minute past two o'clock. And now reporting the news from our newsroom, Shervin Trag. And to recap, police today sees Lee H. Oswald, identified as chairman of a fair play for Cuba committee, as the prime suspect in the assassination of President Kennedy. Police said Oswald, 24 years old, was accused in the slaying of a Dallas policeman shortly after the shooting of the president. Police Captain Pat Genaway said the suspect was an employee in the building where a rifle was found. Genaway said the suspect had visited Russia and was married to a Russian. This has not immediately been confirmed. Oswald was pulled screaming and yelling from the Texas theater in the Oak Cliff section of Dallas. He brandished a pistol which officers took away from him after a scuffle. A policeman who was cut on the face in the scuffle quoted Oswald as saying, well, it's all over now. A large crowd had congregated around the theater and witnessed the arrest. Police had to hold the crowds back because many apparently connected with the arrested man with the slaying of the president. The officer who was slain, J.D. Tepet, had been killed by a man answering the description of Oswald in the neighborhood just a short time before. Recapping the... Tragic news of this day, President Kennedy is dead, assassinated in a burst of gunfire in downtown Dallas. Texas Governor John Connolly riding in the famous bubble top presidential limousine, the top down, also was shot and seriously wounded. The 46-year-old president was shot through the throat and head, possibly by the same bullet. The attending surgeon, Dr. Malcolm Perry, said there was an entrance wound below his Adam's apple. There was another wound in the back of his head. Connolly was hit in the head, wrist, and leg. As the car carrying the Kennedys and the Connollys neared a triple underpass, three bursts of gunfire were heard. Mrs. Kennedy cradled her husband's head in her lap and shouted, Oh, no. The First Lady was not hit. The President's blood-spattered car cut out of the motorcade. It raced behind screaming motorcycle police sirens to Parkland Hospital in Dallas. Two litters were brought out. One for the President, one for the Governor. Mr. Kennedy was conscious as he was carried into the hospital. Father Hubber from Holy Trinity Roman Catholic Church was called. He administered the last rites of the church. Mr. Kennedy lived 30 minutes after he was cut down. The time of death placed at approximately 11 a.m. Vancouver time. He was the fourth U.S. president to be assassinated while in office. President and Mrs. Kennedy were nearing the end of a two-day tour of Texas. They and their party landed at San Antonio yesterday, went to Houston, then flew to Fort Worth last night. They flew to Dallas this morning and were en route to a presidential speaking engagement when the assassin's bullet struck. 
They were to have flown to Austin, the state capital, for a dinner tonight at the governor's mansion. Vice President L.B. Johnson, a Texan, was in the same motorcade, but some distance back from the president, he was not harmed. Johnson was in the hospital when Mr. Kennedy died. But shortly after the death, he was whisked from the hospital under heavy guard. He was sworn in as America's 36th president in the airliner that had flown President Kennedy to Dallas this morning. Thus, London, that should read Lyndon Johnson, automatically became president with Kennedy's death. The presidential oath which he took later is, I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will do the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Present at the swearing-in of Johnson were Mrs. Kennedy, Mrs. Johnson, several staff members, and several congressmen. Johnson asked as many of the White House people as possible to crowd into the executive suite of the plane to witness his swearing-in ceremony. Governor John Connolly of Texas, cut down on the same attack, has undergone an operation for a gunshot wound in the chest. Although doctors say Connolly is not out of the woods, they say his vital signs are good. They say he has a good pulse and that his respiration is satisfactory. The reaction around the world was immediate and stunned. In the House of Commons in Parliament Hill, Prime Minister Pearson announced the news in hushed tones, immediately adjourned the House until Monday noon. In Vancouver, Premier Bennett expressed shock and almost disbelief, and then expressed his sympathies and condolences to the Kennedy family. The Premier also announced that schools throughout the province will close for the remainder of this day. Opposition leader Bob Strachan expressed shock and sympathy at the stunning news. Lieutenant Governor George Perks announced all social engagements at Government House are cancelled until after the President's funeral. The United States reeled in stunned disbelief today at the news that President Kennedy had been shot and killed by the assassin. Business came to an near standstill from coast to coast. Anger followed the initial shock. The stock markets closed. The Senate recessed in Washington. Senator Wayne Morris, an Oregon Democrat, said, if there ever was an hour when all Americans should pray, this is the hour. The spokesman says Attorney General Robert Kennedy is remaining at his estate at McLean, Virginia. The other brother, Senator Edward Kennedy, was presiding over the Senate when the news came. His staff says it is not known where he went. The president's mother reportedly was planning to leave their Hyannis, Massachusetts home immediately for Dallas. His father, a semi-invalid, was napping when the news came. They had no comment. In Moscow, the Soviet news agency TASS carried a flash on the death. Britain has issued his, its terse statement. The prime minister has learned with the most profound shock and horror of the death by assassination of the president of the United States. There was no word at the White House by late afternoon whether the president's children, Caroline, almost six, and John F. Kennedy, Jr., almost three, had been told of their father's death. Here at home and on the scene with news of an armed holdup in downtown Vancouver, NW reporter Mark Rain. General, how would you counsel the American people at this time? In the face of such a terrible thing, I'm sure the uh, entire citizenry of the nation will join as one man in expressing their, not only their grief, but their indi indignation at this act, and will stand faithfully behind the government. General, could you tell us how you got the word? I was at a meeting uh, for the United Nations. And uh, while there, a member of the meeting was called out and uh, came back and told us the news. Although at that time, uh, uh, we did not know the president was dead. We did not know when I got back here at that time that he was dead. But um, matter of fact, we had a, the last message we had was one rather of hope. And the entire company, I merely pause for a minute at the request of the chairman and each of us in his own way uh, said a silent prayer for the president. Mr. Uh, Should there be any concern, sir, over national security at a time like this? No. I think the whole nation now would be uh, almost all of us security agents. General, uh, will the nation be all right in a few months ahead? Oh, I'm not going to uh, predict anything of that. I just say this. The American nation is a people of great common sense. And they are not going to be stampeded or bewildered. 
Thank you, General Mr. President. Harvey. History has uh, had assassinations affected uh, the political course of events. Well, of course, in Lincoln's uh, assassination, you were the uh, presidency went to a man who was a registered Democrat, uh, Mr. Johnson, in uh, Garfield. I doubt that there was any. And, of course, McKinley, that brought in uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Of course, there have been other attempts in late years. Uh, Mr. Truman was at a grave threat toward his, to his life. And Mr. Roosevelt, just before he was inaugurated, you remember, down in, uh, when the Mayor Cermak was killed, was, uh, ran a very grave uh, risk. There, these things have happened, and, and, and it seems inexplicable to me, because Americans are loyal. And it's just this uh, occasional psychopathic sort of uh, uh, accident that occurs. And I, I don't know what we can do about it. Could you say anything, General, about how people will feel abroad from all your experience with the United Nations and others? How will it be taken abroad? Well, I think they will be uh, a bit bewildered. This, um, in the civilized countries of the world, this doesn't happen uh, so often. And... Uh, you remember in the, the starting of World War I, the uh, murder of the Archduke Ferdinand, I think his name was. Why, this itself almost uh, well, was one of the contributory causes to uh, that war. And, uh, but here, I, I just don't know what happens. And if, but we are a nation that where our freedoms are allowed or are uh, observed in such a way that everybody is uh, uh, ready. Uh, to, I mean, everybody is, uh, you might say, capable of doing this if he's ready to put his own life on the line. General, how will you spend the rest of today and tomorrow? How do you, how I, will you spend the rest of today and, and tomorrow? Okay. I expect, I have canceled the dinner date that I had for tonight. Tomorrow, I'm going immediately to my home, and if I'm wanted for any purpose whatsoever, I will, of course, be available. Do you have any advice for the American people? No, as I said, I know the American people will stand solid and they will not be uh, stampeded. Thank you, Mr. President. Right. Thank, Thank you. you Good night, uh, fellows. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have further reports on the cabinet officers, the six officers of the government who were away when President Kennedy was assassinated. Bill Roddy, NBC News, San Francisco, reports that Secretary of State Dean Rusk and the party of five other cabinet officers have left Honolulu for the nonstop flight to Washington. As you may remember, they were on their way to Tokyo from Honolulu when they got the word aboard their plane and they ordered it to return to Honolulu. They have now refueled and they're on their way nonstop all the way to Washington, apparently with no stop on the way to such as San Francisco. Their military jet is expected to land at Andrews Air Force Base at 12.29 a.m. on Saturday morning. An Air Force official in Honolulu told Roddy by telephone a few minutes ago that the sequence of events that brought the cabinet officers back to Hawaii was about like this. They left for Tokyo as scheduled at 7.03 Honolulu time this morning. At 8.37, they received word that the president had been wounded in a bulletin from a press association. They had no further confirmation they continued their journey at 9 a.m. it was decided to return to Honolulu at 9:33 they received word that the president had died uh, and secretary of state Rusk got the plane public address system going to announce the sad news to the other cabinet officials Mr. Rusk along with secretary Dillon of the treasury Douglas Dillon Udall and Freeman and Hodges and Wirtz issued the following statement we are deeply shocked by this grievous tragedy which has removed the great and beloved leader of our country and of the world quest for peace. Our hearts are with Mrs. Kennedy and her family at this time of sorrow, and we renew our dedication. Our pray prayers go with President Johnson as he assumes the high responsibility of the presidency. A book of condolences has been opened at the American Embassy here in Rome. Although it is now almost 11.30 at night, about 150 people are lined up at the embassy to sign and thereby to indicate uh, their sympathy with the Kennedy family and the American government. The Church of Santa Susana, the American Catholic Church in Rome, 
has announced that tomorrow afternoon, Francis Cardinal Spellman of New York will celebrate Requiem Mass uh, in honor of the president. Uh, flags uh, will fly at half-mast here in Italy for three days. This has just been ordered by Italian President Antonio Segni. And at five minutes past midnight, Rome time, in about three quarters of an hour from now, uh, the Italians will have an opportunity uh, to see something of this American tragedy uh, via a satellite feed of film from the United States. This is Irving R. Levine, NBC News, Rome. The connection of the president's assassination, at least, at least its potential connection with the Cold War, is being stressed in various parts of the world. As we have heard from Bonn, Germany, the number one alert is up for the military services of that country. That's next to the alert for war because they're in close contact with the Eastern Satellite Nations and uh, they do not expect any trouble, but this kind of alert is normal in this kind of situation. And now we have word from Laredo, Texas. A bulletin. The Mexican government officially announces through its Laredo offices that it has sealed the Texas-Mexican border for 72 hours against the passage of any person who may wish to pass. That might be an indication that it is generally suspected that the plot extends beyond the young man Oswald who was arrested in Dallas and who has now been connected with the Fair Play for Cuba Committee in the United States and who is reported to have asked or have boasted that he would like to be a citizen of Russia. This young man is being intensively questioned in the Dallas Police Headquarters at this time. The witnesses to the assassination who could possibly identify him have not seen him yet. His fingerprint record is being checked out. The police, all federal authorities, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Secret Service, are all moving extremely carefully to be sure that they're making no mistake in their haste to solve the assassination of President Kennedy in Dallas, Texas at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time today. And now we would like to give you more detail on the Kennedy children. As we've told you before, Caroline and John, Caroline 6 and John 3, were at the White House when their president, when their father was killed. Uh, Sergeant Shriver, brother-in-law of the president, husband of Eunice Shriver, the president's sister, and Eunice went to the White House immediately. They saw that the children were in the good care of Maud Shaw, an old family friend, and then they immediately went to Hyannisport or Boston to be with Joseph Kennedy, the president's father, and Mrs. Kennedy. But Mr. Shriver apparently is in charge of funeral arrangements because the military is clearing through him the details. Meanwhile, the two children are at the White House. Uh, Mr. Shriver did not tell the children that their father was dead, even though he knew it when he visited them at the White House. Apparently, no one else has told the children of the death of their father. One reason is that great birthday plans had been underway for the sixth birthday next Wednesday for Carolyn and the third birthday on Monday for John. Next week was to have been a big week for the first family. There had been lots of fun and party plans underway for the two children to celebrate John's birthday actually on Monday, November the 25th, but they were going to celebrate on Tuesday because his playmates could be at the White House at that time. Party plans were also ready for Caroline on Wednesday. Caroline was to be the star at a big family birthday gathering with all her cousins at Cape Cod in Massachusetts. All of the Kennedys were, have been, were to have been together for their traditional Thanksgiving gathering at High Hennesport on Thursday. And now, for the sad prospect of arrival of the party from Dallas to Washington, that's the presidential party including President Lyndon Johnson, Mrs. Johnson and Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy, and the body of President Kennedy. They had left Dallas early in the afternoon. They're expected in Washington at 5.30. Now we take you for more detail on the arrival to Robert Goralski, NBC News, at the White House. President Kennedy's body will lie in repose in the East Room of the White House tomorrow for eight hours. 
The term lie in repose indicates a private funeral arrangement. He will later lie in state in the Capitol building. The new president, Lyndon Johnson, who arrives in Washington in something like 45 minutes from now, will proceed immediately from Andrews Air Force Base in nearby Maryland to the White House. We will go into a meeting with Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara and McGeorge Bundy, who is President Kennedy's advisor on national security matters. At 8 o'clock this evening, President Johnson will meet with the bipartisan leadership of the Congress. While President Kennedy's body lies in repose in the East Room of the White House tomorrow, his family will view him first, beginning at 10 o'clock in the morning. They will be followed by President Johnson, by the Speaker of the House of Representatives, John McCormick, former Presidents Truman and Eisenhower, and members of the executive branch of the government who hold presidential appointments. In the afternoon, members of the Supreme Court and members of the federal judiciary will also view President Kennedy's body. At 2.30s, members of the Senate, members of the House, and the governors of the 50 states and territories, and at 5 o'clock, members of the diplomatic corps will view the body of President Kennedy in the East Room of the White House. Vice President... Uh, president Johnson will make his first statement as President of the United States when he lands at Andrews Air Force Base at 6.05 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, approximately 40 minutes from now. This is Robert Goralski, NBC News, reporting from the White House. Uh, Robert Goralski, will you hang on a moment there? We now have from the other end of uh, Pennsylvania Avenue the report that President Johnson will meet at the White House tonight with Defense Secretary Robert McNamara. And the White House national security aide, McGeorge Bundy, and then he will confer with the bipartisan leadership of Congress. I didn't catch whether you covered that part of it or not. It seems to be very important all around the world now that we know the possible nature of the assassination of the president, possibly a plot not by the communist world itself, but by one of its misguided followers. It is important that the continuity of government and the national defense be stressed at this time that's one reason why six cabinet members are flying back. They were on the way to Tokyo, flying back to Washington, and will arrive early tomorrow morning. And now we understand that we have more detail on uh, the possible solution of the assassination of President Kennedy. Let's go again to WFAA in Dallas to Tom Perryman. Will you come in, Tom? The uh, report we have right now is that uh, Governor Connolly also shot, is reported in satisfactory condition. Dr. Robert Shaw says he'll have to stay in the hospital at least two weeks. Also, we have an eyewitness report to the shooting and would like for you to hear that now. I am L.J. Lewis, uh, 500 East Jefferson Avenue in Oak Hill. And uh, <clears throat> we were sitting in the office here and we heard the shot. And uh, I just casually made the remark. I said, I bet they have him cornered. And so I looked up the street and saw the suspect coming down the street and he was reloading his revolver and stuck it in his belt when he got uh, well, just across the street from us. And he turned and went up the street, and uh, I immediately phoned the police and uh, one of the boys here in the office, Warren Reynolds and uh, Pat Patterson, they followed the suspect up the street where he turned behind the service station and to the alley. Uh, I immediately uh, phoned the police, and uh, Warren and Pat Patterson uh, you know, followed the suspect on up the street. And uh, after that, what I mean is just a uh, uh, <clears throat> matter of time, you know, to all the police and everything were around here. That was the voice of L.J. Lewis, an eyewitness to the assassination of President Kennedy. We have some reaction here to the shooting, and we'd like to call in Roger Reddy here at WFAA for that report. A salesman traveling on the road called the newsroom at WFAA and made mention of the fact that as he heard the information of President Kennedy's death, on the radio while traveling through Waco, north through Texas on the highways, he noticed that all along the way, truck drivers were pulled off to the side of the road and in parking areas, and they were openly weeping and sobbing. People, passengers in cars had pulled off to the road and were talking quietly in a numbed manner. Also, some were weeping. The entire scene on the Texas highways reflected the sadness of President Kennedy's demise. All social and civic functions have been canceled in the Dallas area for the weekend, too. Dallas schools, however, did remain in session. Thank you, Roger Reddy. One final note, Morgan. Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy at Parkland Hospital took her ring off and put it on John F. Kennedy's hand. She lifted the president's hand and kissed it. One final note. 
That's the story from Dallas, Morgan Beatty. Thank you, Tom. And now, for those who may just have tuned in, this report is continuous on the assassination of President Kennedy at 12.30 p.m. At least he was shot at that moment. And his death at 1 p.m. in Parkman Hospital, Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas. We pause 10 seconds for station identification. It will be 89 on November the 30th. He issued a statement from his London res residence after listening to BBC television accounts of the president's death and the radio. The loss to the United States, said Sir Winston, and to the world is incalculable. Those who come after Mr. Kennedy must strive the more to achieve the ideals of world peace and human happiness and dignity to which his presidency was dedicated. A spokesman for Sir Winston said he and Lady Churchill sat up past 10 p.m., that is, British time, to keep in touch with developments on television. I so well remember Sir Winston's statement at the death of President Roosevelt. He said his was an enviable death, meaning that it had come at the apex of his career. And he spoke almost as if he himself had wished that he could die at the apex of success at the end of World War II. In this case, of course, you have a much younger statesman, and Sir, Winston reaction, Sir Winston's reaction was entirely different. This monstrous act, he said, has taken from us a great statesman and a wise and valiant man. The civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King, is reported to be in a state of shock at the news of President Kennedy's death. NBC News obtained from him, however, a statement. I am shocked and grief-stricken at the tragic assassination of President Kennedy, said Dr. Martin Luther King. He was a great and dedicated president. His death is a great loss to America and to the world. The finest tribute that the American people can pay to the late President Kennedy is to implement the progressive policies that he sought to initiate in foreign and domestic relations. From East Berlin, the East German communist leader Walter Ulbricht announced tonight he had learned the news of President Kennedy's death with sadness and deep indignation. He expressed sympathy for the American people who had lost one of the most outstanding statesmen. Among the ordinary people of East Berlin, the reaction was of shock and horror. An East Berlin taxi driver said, A great pity. We all liked him so much. In the past, they haven't shown that very much. Incidentally, the Chief Justice of the United States has issued a statement... Chief Justice Warren, he said today that President Kennedy was assassinated as a result of the hatred and bitterness that has been injected into the life of our nation by bigots. Perhaps Chief Justice Warren was thinking of the civil rights struggle when he issued his statement because at that time it was unknown to him, could not have been known to him, that the suspect in the hands of the police is a man connected with the communist cause rather than the civil rights cause. There. there has been a profound reaction to the death of President Kennedy in Canada. Our Canadian friends, despite our differences, are always closer to us than any other people. We take you now to Leith Eid in Ottawa. A deeply shaken Prime Minister Lester Pearson announced the news of President Kennedy's death to Canada's House of Commons. An aide walked to his front bench shortly before the beginning of the afternoon session and handed him a slip of paper. In a voice that was close to the breaking point several times, the Prime Minister told a hushed Commons that the President's death is a tragedy for all of us. No people, he said, will share more deeply in that tragedy than the people of Canada, the neighbors of the United States. He said, our hearts are filled with sadness. The Prime Minister was a longtime personal friend of the late President, dating from the time when Mr. Pearson was Canadian ambassador to Washington and Mr. Kennedy was a senator. The Prime Minister's tribute was followed by those of the other party groups and Commons immediately adjourned until Monday. All Canadian radio and television stations broke schedules to carry uninterrupted news of the President's assassination and to recall his 1961 visit to Canada. Leith Eid, NBC News, Ottawa. 
Ladies and gentlemen, it occurred to us that you perhaps would like to hear the speech uh, that President Kennedy was to have delivered just after his assassination in Dallas, Texas. He would have said this. My friends and fellow citizens, I cite facts and figures to make it clear that America today is stronger than ever before. Our adversaries have not abandoned their ambitions. Our dangers have not diminished. Our vigilance cannot be relaxed. But now we have the military, the scientific, and the economic strength to do whatever must be done for the preservation and the promotion of freedom. That strength will never be used in pursuit of aggressive ambition. It will always be used in pursuit of peace. It will never be used to promote provocations. It will always be used to promote the peaceful settlement of disputes. We in this country the late president was to have said, in this generation, are by destiny rather than choice the watchmen on the walls of world freedom. We ask, therefore, that we may be worthy of our power and responsibility, that we may exercise our strength with wisdom and restraint, that we may achieve in our time and for all time the ancient vision of peace on earth goodwill toward men. That must always be our goal, and the righteousness of our cause must always underlie our strength. For as was written long ago, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. If the President of the United States has known, had known he was going to die, his speech on the, an occasion to have followed his assassination could never have been more thoughtfully conceived to mark his tragic end. John Lavichek reports from Miami that Havana Radio has just broken into its regular news broadcast very belatedly with a bulletin and is broadcasting the news of President Kennedy's death to the Cuban people. The radio announcer in Havana on Fidel Castro's radio is a woman. She's broadcasting a press association dispatch from the United States. She is giving all the information she has at the time. All other nations apparently broke into the radio immediately. But in Cuba, they waited. Now they know that a fair play for Cuba committeeman, an American citizen, one of their sympathizers, is a prime suspect, that's the definition of the Dallas police, in the assassination of President Kennedy. The British ambassador, Sir David Ormsby Gore, as you may recall in some of your reading or listening on the air, was a particularly close friend of President Kennedy, and that stems from the days when Joseph Kennedy, his father, was ambassador in Great Britain. Sir David Ormsby Gore has issued this brief statement. This horrible, wicked, and senseless act has deprived not only the American people, but the world of a great and wonderful man. Jack Kennedy was the best and most loyal friend one could ever hope to have. And I feel a sense of loss beyond description. That, of course, that last sentence is a reference to his very close personal friendship with the man who was president of the United States. Incidentally, we have more detail on the man Oswald, who was arrested in Dallas as a prime suspect in the death of President Kennedy. As we've noted before, the man had obtained a job in the warehouse, the textbook repository, in Dallas. It was empty at the time. It was being refurbished for some reason or another. He had obtained a job in that building, and the shots were, that killed the president were fired from it. And as we've noted before, Oswald's supervisor said the man had been in the building at noon. That's the last time he had seen him. The shooting took place about 12.30. And now further details. Suspect Oswald is reported to have a Russian wife. On November the 1st, 1959, he told the U.S. Embassy in Moscow 
that he had applied for Soviet citizenship. He said he had been a tourist in Russia since October the 13th of the year 1959. Oswald returned to his Fort Worth home from Russia last year. He apparently had become disillusioned by life in the Soviet Union. Incidentally, the questioning is proceeding in Dallas, and, of course, it includes the shooting of both the policeman who was shot near a theater in a suburb of Dallas and the shooting of the president. According to Carlos Bringuier of the Cuban Student Directory in New Orleans, Oswald was in New Orleans two months ago as the chairman of a pro-Castro fair play for Cuba committee. Oswald and several Cubans were arrested two months ago in the Louisiana city, that's New Orleans, for passing out allegedly pro-communist literature. Edward Scannell Butler III of the Information Council of the Americas reports that he and Oswald once debated communism. He said Oswald had renounced his United States citizenship and went to the Soviet Union to marry a Russian. Police had a Dallas address for Oswald. A caption on a photograph in the United Press International Photo Offices in New York shows Oswald in a hotel room in Moscow on November the 14th, 1959. He had served in the U.S. Marines and wore a Marine-style crew haircut in the picture that was taken in Moscow. He had joined the Marine Corps when he was 17 years old. He had sought citizenship in Russia. He told UPI correspondent Aline Mosby in Moscow this. That was in 1959. Quote, It was like getting out of prison when he left America to seek Soviet citizenship. He had vowed he never would return to the United States. At the time of his trip to Moscow, he mentioned he would like to go to Cuba to join Fidel Castro. The Soviets, he said, refused him citizenship. Oswald speaks Russian. He had a child by a Russian wife. Oswald returned to the United States in 1962, stating that lack of money while a child and imperialism, his word, had led him to renounce his native land. Captain Will Fritz, the head of the Dallas Homicide Division, reports that Oswald told him he was a pro-Castro man and that he had lived in Russia. Oswald was handcuffed and had minor facial cuts when he was brought into police headquarters. Police said he had a sullen look. And Captain Fritz adds this, quote, Oswald hasn't admitted anything yet, but he looks like a good suspect. He came from Fort Worth, where his family was respected. He had two brothers who were veterans, and his father was a veteran. Police describe him as a cool character under questioning. The policeman who was killed was, of course, J.D. Tippett, as we've told you. He was slain, and his fellow officers, M. M., uh, officer M.N. McDonald chased the suspect into a rear exit of the Texas theater. Apparently, the man was trapped. Tippett and McDonald had received a tip that the assassin of President Kennedy might have gone into the theater. An usher told them a man in a brown shirt had entered the darkened theater a few moments before. According to police headquarters, Tippett fired a shot. McDonald rushed the suspect, and the suspect said, It's all over now. McDonald and the suspect crawled, uh, sprawled over a seat in the theater. McDonald's face was slashed. Police said it was a four-inch gash inflicted by the suspect. It was in the cornering, apparently, that policeman Tippett was shot. And now, if we may summarize on the suspect in the assassination of President Kennedy. Dallas, Texas, state line. Lee H. Oswald, a 1959 defector to Russia and chairman of a pro-Castro fair play for Cuba committee, was placed in jail today after questioning in police headquarters as the prime suspect in the assassination of the president. Recapping the day's news, President Kennedy died by an assassin's bullet today, and Lyndon B. Johnson has taken the oath of office as the new president of the United States. Johnson was sworn in by a federal judge aboard the presidential plane at Dallas's Love Field. He was preparing to fly to Washington to take up the duties of the American chief executive. Mrs. Kennedy and Mrs. Johnson were among those present at the swearing in. Kennedy was shot through the head and neck as he rode through Dallas, Texas. He slumped forward. Mrs. Kennedy turned in the seat ahead and cried, oh no. She tried to cradle her husband's head in her arms. The limousine took off at top speed for Parkland Hospital. The 46-year-old president died there about one half hour later. The president was administered the last rites of the Roman Catholic Church shortly after he was carried into the hospital. A doctor said the president lost consciousness as soon as he was hit. He never revived. The doctor said, we never had any hope.
of saving his life. A crowd of Dallas people thronged around the hospital where the president died. The ambulance, which took the body away, almost had to stop because of the crush of the silent waiting people. The Secret Service, the FBI, and the Dallas police swung into action within seconds after the fatal shots were fired in Dallas today. They are joining in what is perhaps the biggest and most determined manhunt in the nation's history. Meanwhile, a young man who said two years ago he wanted Russian citizenship is the prime suspect arrested in the Kennedy assassination. His name, Lee H. Oswald. He is chairman of a Fair Play for Cuba committee. He was pulled screaming and yelling from a Dallas theater shortly after a Dallas policeman was shot to death. The policeman died in trying to arrest Oswald, a resident of nearby Fort Worth, Texas. Oswald returned to his Fort Worth, Texas home from Russia last year after having been in the Soviet Union since 1959. He spent his time in Russia working in a factory in Minsk, left only after he apparently became disillusioned with life under communist rule. He had gone to Russia after his discharge from the U.S. Marines and announced he wanted to remain there. After having a change of heart, however, he applied for a passport in the autumn of 1962, saying he wanted to return to the United States with the Russian wife he married in the Soviet Union. They have an infant child. The passport was issued and the Soviet authorities granted exit permits for him and his family. It was in 1959, after he had defected to the Soviet Union, that Oswald told American embassy officials that he had applied for Soviet citizenship. Oswald worked in the building from which the shots were fired. His supervisor said he was there at noon, but lost track of him from then on. The building was the Texas School Book Depo Deposition Building, where a 765, that should read 7.65, German-made Mauser bolt-action rifle was found after the assassination of Mr. Kennedy. According to police, the suspect fired at policeman J.D. Tippett and another officer. Tippett was killed. Oswald put up a fight but was subdued outside a theater as a crowd of 600 people watched. He's a former Marine, described as a self-styled communist, who once renounced his American citizenship and tried unsuccessfully to become a citizen of Russia. Police say Oswald is being questioned both for the assassination of President Kennedy and the slaying of the Dallas policeman. Meanwhile, the president's body is being returned to Washington tonight. Officials at Andrews Air Force Base near Washington say the presidential plane, the big jet, in which the chief executive rode so often, is due to a land momentarily. It's announced in Washington that the president's body will lie in state at the White House tomorrow, and it's understood the funeral will take place in Boston. Governor John Connolly of Texas, wounded by the same sniper who killed the president, is described now as being in satisfactory condition. An aide said he was wounded in the right arm, in the right leg, and in the back. Caroline Kennedy, who observes her sixth birthday next Wednesday, and her brother John Jr. were in the White House when their father was killed in Dallas. John Jr. observes his birthday Monday. He was born shortly after the president was elected. It is believed that Mrs. Kennedy will be the one to tell the children of their father's death. Earlier this year, the Kennedy's infant son died two days after he had been born. The Mexican border was sealed immediately after the assassination of President Kennedy. The Organization of American States summoned its executive council for an emergency meeting in Washington. Major stock and commodity exchanges in this country and the U.S. closed quickly after the assassination, but before the close, prices had gone into a tailspin. Overseas, Vatican City, Pope Paul prayed for the soul of the dead American president. The pontiff deplored the assassination and praised Mr. Kennedy as a great statesman. The U.S. Senate was in session when news arrived that the president was shot. It adjourned after a prayer. A chaplain, the Reverend Frederick Harris, prayed that the senators and the people of the country be strong and steady and that God save the state. In Ottawa, the commons adjourned until Monday out of respect. Prime Minister Pearson, Opposition Leader Diefenbaker, and other party leaders spoke briefly in tribute to the late president. All said the Canadian people share the sorrow of the U.S. Mr. Pearson said it is a tragedy for all of us. Provincial reaction to the shocking news was immediate and stunned. Premier Bennett said, we in B.C. feel this loss as he was always a good friend to our province and to Canada. He was a great world statesman and a good friend. Opposition leader Bob Strachan said Premier Bennett was speaking for all parties and all the people of B.C. 
The Premier also asked that all schools in the province be closed for the remainder of this day. The flags on top of government buildings will be flown at half-mast. The Lieutenant Governor has cancelled all social engagements until after the presidential funeral. Government offices, however, will not close today. Opening of the new John Henderson Elementary School in Vancouver will go ahead as scheduled. Loot totals between three and four thousand dollars in the bank hold up in Vancouver. The forklift then went back up to the side of the plane and Mrs. Kennedy holding hands with the president's brother, the attorney general, stood as the lift slowly lowered Mrs. Kennedy and the attorney general down to the ground and the rest of the presidential party. And they prepare for the sad trip, a very brief one to the White House aboard the helicopter where the body will lie in repose tomorrow. It's been announced that President Johnson will confer tonight with the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara. There is significance in such a conference because President Truman and President Eisenhower, before President Kennedy, had arranged for similar brief uh, meetings uh, with Vice Presidents, uh, Vice President Johnson, that is, President Johnson, when he was Vice President, was kept briefed on every aspect of our national affairs, particularly national security. There will be no need for any more than a formal conference noting the takeover, noting any wishes that the President may have at this time. And so the party goes to the White House. It hasn't been revealed whether Mrs. Kennedy had a chance to change that blood-soaked stocking on the way from Dallas to Washington. She probably paid no attention to it, whatever. We have a statement now from a Protestant leader on behalf of the country's three and a half million Episcopalians, the Right Reverend Arthur Lichtenberger. He's presiding bishop of the Protestant Episcopal Church in the USA. He says this, and we quote him directly. The whole world is shocked and saddened at the news of the assassination of our president. May God in his infinite goodness receive him into the light abundant. Right, Reverend Arthur? I join with men and women everywhere in our expression of grief and assure the family of President Kennedy of our continuing prayers. We thank God for the integrity and courage of John Kennedy. He has given his life for his country. That's about the fifth time there has been a reference to the fact that President Kennedy has given his life for his country just like a soldier gives his life on a battlefield because certainly exposure of their bodies by presidents is an act of devotion in itself and all presidents go through it. Ladies and gentlemen, the NBC radio network will stay on the air with continuous coverage of the tragic death of President Kennedy until 1 a.m. Eastern Time tonight. And we will resume coverage of a nation in mourning and all the events that surround it. We will resume at 7.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time Saturday, tomorrow morning, with continuous coverage. Ladies and gentlemen, we repeat once again that radio station CKNW has interrupted Ladies and gentlemen, the Prime Minister, the Right Honorable L.B. Pearson. Mesdames et Messieurs, le Premier Ministre, le Très Honorable Lester B. Pearson. The Parliament of Canada was hushed this afternoon. The voice of party controversy was silenced. And I performed, as Prime Minister, the hard duty of announcing the sad news of the death of the President of the United States. A death so sudden and so shocking that it left us, as I'm sure it left you, stunned and unbelieving. The world can ill afford his loss. Canadians 
next to Americans themselves, will feel most deeply the tragedy of that loss. That loss through assassination is one of the great tragedies of history. But for us, and now, it is something more. It is a great, heartbreaking, personal tragedy. And there are millions of people tonight who, throughout the world, will feel that they have lost a friend. President Kennedy was young. He was a man of courage in war and in peace. He devoted himself to public service. He worked unselfishly for the public good as he saw it. He has paid for this public service with his life. For the president, it was death on duty. When a free man falls courageously in action, all freedom grieves. But courage is made easier for others. When a young man and a good man is stricken, we all feel a little older but we have a deeper resolve to be better ourselves. At this sad moment, I think of what the loss of the president means to his country, to this hemisphere, and to the world. This young man with the vigor and decisiveness of his years and his character, but with wisdom and experience beyond those years. But above all, I think tonight of his wife, for whom this has been a very dark year, and of his family. I have sent to her and to the family our deep and heartfelt sympathy. Canadians will share her grief as we share the sense of loss of the American people in the loss of their president. To us in Canada, President Kennedy was a special friend. He stood for those things for which most of us in Canada have deep sympathy. He stood for understanding and good relations between his own country and ours. Mr. Kennedy was always firm and straightforward in expressing the viewpoint of his own country. But he was always understanding of the viewpoint of Canada. He was a man of, of, of generous mind, of generous instinct. He had a quality of mind and a quality of spirit far surpassing the usual quality even of men who become the leaders of great nations. I had a warm and understanding friendship with Mr. Kennedy and I feel that I have lost a friend. It was a relationship that went beyond the official, and I shall miss him very much. Only a few weeks ago, he asked me if I could spend uh, with him an evening and speak with him at the annual dinner of the Kennedy Foundation for Mental Health. My wife and I were looking forward to an informal visit with Mr. and Mrs. Kennedy at that time. And now he has been cut down. In his death, I dare to believe, he has united men of goodwill with a closer, more 
personal realization of their common concern, of their mutual involvement, than they had before. That is the measure of the breadth of his own concern. His death, then, is a tragedy not only for his own country, but for the world, because it is for the peace and freedom and welfare of people all over the world that he fought so courageously and so well. He was the leader of the richest and most powerful country in history. He came himself from among its richest, but he was always deeply concerned with the poor and the oppressed, with the sick and the needy. His appeal was not to the comfortable, but to the dairy. Listen to these words from his inaugural address in Washington nearly three years ago. This is what he said then. Now the trumpet summons us again, not as a call to battle, though in battle we are, but a call to bear the burden of a long twilight struggle year in and year out, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, a struggle against the common enemies of man, tyranny, poverty, disease, and war itself. These words were the measure of that man. For him, the burden has now been lifted. But for us, that trumpet still sounds. There is a mystery in a tragedy of, of this kind that we cannot easily or fully understand. But as we lament the tragedy, we are grateful for the president's life and for his work for the service that he gave and for the way he prepared himself for that service and for the courage he has shown in discharging. May he rest in the peace that he has earned and may God comfort those close to him in this hour of sadness and desolation. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard the Prime Minister, the Right Honorable Lester B. Pearson. ...tonight, and Lyndon Johnson made his first statement as U.S. President after flying in from Dallas with the sad cargo of the presidential plane. The bronze casket was placed in a military ambulance to be taken to the Naval Hospital at Bethesda, Maryland, where it will remain tonight. Mrs. Kennedy stepped into the ambulance, and at 3.10 p.m. Vancouver time, the ambulance carrying Mrs. Kennedy and the body of the president began its trip to Bethesda Naval Hospital. A funeral cortege of four or five black limousines followed the ambulance from the field. After the hearse left the apron of the airport, President and Mrs. Johnson descended the stairway of the plane and approached a bank of microphones being lined up on the edge. Leading members of the House and Senate walked up to President Johnson and shook his hand. Before beginning his talk, Johnson pulled his wife closer. Then, with a grim expression on his face, he began slowly his first statement as President of the United States. Johnson said, this is a sad time. He said the country has suffered a sad loss, and he has suffered a personal one. The world shares the loss, he said, with Mrs. Kennedy. He went on, I will do my best. That is all I can do. I ask your help and God's. After his statement, Johnson spoke briefly with congressional leaders. Then Johnson slowly made his way through the crowd to the presidential helicopter, shaking hands with a few friends along the way. With Mrs. Johnson leading the way, he climbed into the helicopter and soon was on his way to the White House. Kennedy's body will lie in repose at the White House tomorrow from 7 a.m. until 3 p.m. Vancouver time for viewing by the president's family 
high officials of the government and the diplomatic corps. The general public will not be admitted. It was the expectation of high government officials that the body will be taken to the Capitol building Sunday, but arrangements are not yet definite. The funeral probably will be in Boston. A funeral mass will be said Monday in the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington for President Kennedy by Richard Cardinal Cushing of Boston. A spokesman for the Cardinal said the mass will begin at 10 a.m. Vancouver time and there will be no eulogy. The mass will be what is called a low mass with only the Cardinal officiating in contrast to the customary solemn high mass of requiem sung by three clergymen. There is no information on the possible place of burial of the president. Prime Minister Pearson addressed this nation from Ottawa. He said Parliament was hushed this afternoon. The voice of party controversy was silenced as he performed the sad duty of announcing the death of President Kennedy. The Prime Minister said the death was so sudden, so shocking, that it left us, as I'm sure it left you, stunned and unbelieving. Said Pearson, the world can ill afford his loss. Canadians, next to Americans themselves, will feel most deeply the tragedy of that loss. He added, that loss through assassination is one of the great tragedies of history. But for us now, it is something more. It is a great heartbreaking personal tragedy. There are millions of people tonight who will feel they have lost a friend. Pearson said President Kennedy was young. He was a man of courage in war and in peace. He devoted himself to public service. He worked unselfishly for the public good as he sought. He has paid for this public service with his life. For the president, said Pearson, it was death on duty. External Affairs Minister Martin said Canadians, as the closest neighbors and friends of the U.S., feel the death of President Kennedy particularly deeply. In a message to U.S. State Secretary Dean Rusk, he said, the free world can ill afford to lose statesmen of his great courage and leadership. We are all the poorer for his death, and as your closest neighbors and friends, we Canadians feel this loss particularly deeply. The shots that killed President Kennedy apparently were fired from an upper story of a textbook storage building, which commanded a clear view of his motorcade in Dallas. And police say a man they've been questioning, Lee Oswald, who one time wanted Russian citizenship, worked in the building. Police found an old 30 caliber Enfield rifle with telescopic sights in the building. There were also spent cartridges and scraps of fried chicken. The rifle was partly hidden beneath books on the second floor of the five-story building. A Dallas photographer said he looked around as he heard the shots and saw a rifled barrel disappearing into the upper floor window. He did not see the gunman. Oswald was arrested in another section of Dallas after the shooting. After two hours of police questioning, he still was denying any connection with the assassination of President Kennedy. Reaction in B.C. to the shocking news was immediate and stunned. Premier Bennett said, we in British Columbia feel this loss, as he was always a good friend to our province and to Canada. He was a great world statesman and a good friend. Opposition leader Robert Strachan said, Premier Bennett was speaking for all parties and all people of B.C. in his expression of shock and sorrow over the death of President Kennedy. The Premier also asked that all schools in the province be closed for the remainder of today. UBC also canceled classes. Memorial services will be held 12.30 Tuesday in the UBC Armory. The flags on government buildings will be flown at half-mast, and the Lieutenant Governor has canceled all social engagements until after the presidential funeral. The Western Hockey League games tonight have been canceled. Now a look at the weather. Cloudy with a few showers tonight and tomorrow and milder. The current reading is 42 degrees. Now back to our special programming. Thank mm -hmm. you.